I'm really, really trying to get Lorelai to join me. If I haven't made this official yet, uh, Lorelai Shannon has agreed to be my next guest on November 26th. She'll be my last guest of this year on the anniversary of the release of Phantasmagoria 2. And then in December, what am I going to wear? A special guest. Yeah, I definitely had to break out the Craig suit for this one. Hey, everybody, and welcome to chapter eight of Conversations with Curtis, a, an almost year-long celebration of the 25th anniversary of the making of Phantasmagoria II, A Puzzle of Flesh. Thank you so much for joining me uh, today on uh, Black Friday. I guess that's a uh, so take a, taking a little time from all your shopping to, uh, to join us. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Paul Morgan Stetler. I played Curtis Craig in that game. And today is really the culmination of this project that started back in March, really February for me when I first started thinking about it. And I just can't be more excited to, uh, to have our guest today. Lorelai Shannon was the uh, writer and the game designer and the full-on mastermind of Phantasmagoria 2. And really it's all come to this, this moment today where we get to talk about it on the actual anniversary, the 25th anniversary of the game's release. Uh, November 26, 1996, it came out. Um, so uh, we'll bring Lorelai out in a few minutes. I do have some uh, it's good to see everybody. I'm trying to keep up with the comments. It looks like there's a lot of people very excited. Thanks for joining. Um, I have a couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, and then I want to share a little bit of fan art. We haven't done that in a while. Some new stuff has popped up that I want to share. And then, uh, and then we'll bring Lorelai out. So let's see. Okay, first and foremost, I, I don't always do this, but if you aren't following uh, conversations with Curtis on social media, please do so. Uh, we have a stream bot that's going to be popping up throughout the, the chats that will give you all the, all the links, but we'd love to have you join us on Twitter or our Discord channel, which is really fun. And uh, so please, uh, please follow us there, our YouTube channel. Uh, that was one of the YouTube videos that we just did, or that I guess I just did. Um, the other thing that I want to share with you, if you haven't been following, is that I am actually playing Phantasmagoria 2 for the very first time. I've never played it in my entire life, and I am doing a semi-regular Friday stream uh, where at 3 o'clock Pacific time, I am working my way through the game. Daniel Albu is my hint master, my Phantasmagoria Sherpa, and we're having all kinds of fun uh, getting through this game. We're taking it really slow and... Uh, Rachna, who played Therese, joined me for one episode. I'm hoping to get Andy, maybe even Lorelai will join me for a future episode where we can, we can just play the game and, and talk about it. So, uh, so please join us. Uh, it won't be today because today we're 
we're doing something else, but next Friday we'll be back to the game. Um, oh, I have an announcement to make. I mentioned this before and I wasn't able to talk too much about it, but I've recently been uh, offered a role in a play here in Seattle uh, that is gonna happen in February. It's a leading role in a brand new play called Hotter Than Egypt by Yusuf El Gundi. It's gonna happen at ACT Theater, which stands for a contemporary theater. Uh, they have a beautiful theater space uh, in downtown Seattle. I've worked for them a lot over the years. It's my first time back on stage in almost four years um, because I've been doing so many other things. So I'm very excited. Uh, I get to play an ugly American who goes to Egypt with his wife and falls in love with his interpreter. It's a, it's a comedy, but it's also very, uh, uh, it's also very uh, touching play. Uh, and if you're in Seattle in February, we're also going to be performing it in California at the Marin Theater Company uh, in April. So come, come check it out if you can. And the great news, too, is that the person playing my wife in that play is none other than my very good friend, Jen Taylor, who happens to be the voice of Cortana. So we've done some shows in the past, and this is our chance to get back together. And it'll be really fun for you guys to, um, to come join us. So there you go. Thank you for the I'm seeing a lot of congratulations. Thanks. I appreciate that. All right. Um, I want to share with you a few fan art pictures. We were doing that quite a bit in the early episodes and it's kind of fallen off, but uh, a few of them have propped up and I really want to share those with you right now. So this first one, let me make sure I got the right one here, is, uh, there we go. This one is from our Patreon member, uh, goes by Midgalasis, uh, Mary Courtney, Tarani Courtney. Uh, she made this. It's a fan. I just think it's hilarious and wonderful. A little Curtis in uh, in his room. Uh, this was posted on our Discord uh, art submission page. So if anybody has some of their own art they want to, please please go on Discord and, and submit it there. It's really fun. So thank you, uh, Midgalasis, for doing that. It's beautiful. Um, oops, let's see. Here's another one. This one just was posted the other day. Mar on our Discord channel posted this. I think it's great. It's a really, really cool. I get that it looks like it's Wintex office. And you got the, you know, you got the uh, cubicles over here. It looks like there's very stressed out Curtis here. And then looks like this is, you know, Hecatomb Curtis right there laughing at him. Very nice. I love the use of color that he does here. Very nice. And uh, <laughs> this one uh, was from Nugget on, on Discord. And he wrote uh, his, his little caption was blob charms everyone, even the Hecatomb. So there you go. I think that's very true. Blob was a very charming creature. Uh, and then this last one was on Twitter the other day, a perennial astronaut uh, posted this and he wrote uh, some break time lines of Curtis Phantasmagoria 2, love this awkward rat loving nerd ass kink boy. <laughs> Absolutely, I love that he just did this uh, on a break. What an what a amazing artist this guy is. Uh, so really nice work. So thank you so much uh, you guys for submitting those, appreciate it. Um, all right, I'm gonna just talk a little bit more and I have an announcement to make uh, of our mystery guest uh, in December and then, um, and then we'll bring Lorelai out. So I just wanna talk a little bit about this project, Conversations with Curtis. This was something that, you know, was a, pandemic inspired moment. I had free time on my hands. Uh, I had done a couple of small little podcasts uh, to, for some really appreciative fans, uh, Annie Christ and Emil uh, Johansson Levin's podcasts. And it dawned on me that this was the 25th anniversary and I decided to kick off this project. And it's been an incredible journey, uh, diving into the past and talking to all these incredible artists about this game and how much it means to so many of you as fans. And uh, I just never expected it to 
I didn't know what I was expecting, but uh, this has turned into something really special. And we've been on a journey together and I am so uh, proud of what we've accomplished. Um, I don't think many people are doing this with video games, creating oral histories. And I think oral histories are very important to, for, for, to have this on record. Um, people love these things and to be able to hear the people that made them talk about them, it could be an inspiration for, for other generations to make their own games. So I'm, I'm really proud of this and I'm so excited that we get to finish it up with Lorelei today, which means we're kind of coming to an end of an era. So I feel like we need to close the book kind of close the book on Phantasmagoria 2 after today. Um, but I'm not ready to be done. I'm really enjoying this. And so after talking to Patreon members and fans, the plan now is to continue conversations with Curtis by reaching out to our, by looking at some of the other games of that time, FMV games from the 1990s, like other Sierra games like Space Quest and Gabriel Knight, uh, and then other games like Seventh Guest or Mist or Loom or all these games that I just know the titles of but have never played before and reach out to those artists who made those games and do a little bit of what we're doing here and get an oral history, talk to them about their memories of what it was like to make these games. I think it'd be fun for me to play these games like I am with Fantas 2, maybe get them to join me a little bit. So that's the plan. We're gonna start moving forward to other games in, uh, in 2022. And uh, it's an exciting new venture. It's gonna be a lot more work trying to reach out to people that don't know me because I wasn't in their game, but I think that uh, we're onto something really, really cool here. And I uh, just want to uh, uh, invite y'all to join and, and, and stay with me in, in 2022. And this leads me to my guest. We have one more month in 2021 in December. And since we are moving away from Phantasmagoria 2 and moving on to other games, uh, I have a guest lined up and it's gonna be on December 18th, Saturday. And I'm gonna share with you who this mystery guest is. It's a wonderful little bridge between what, where we are now and where we're going. Uh, before I share with you this, uh, this guest, I wanna tell you, first of all, who it isn't, because I think a lot of, uh, I, I'm getting, I know that there are many, many people out there who love and revere Spoonie, Noah Antweiler, who created that amazing playthrough back in 2008. Um, and, uh, and I think people are, and for, I've gotten many comments about hoping I would get a chance to talk to him. And I just want you to know that I have reached out to him. Uh, I haven't heard back. I don't think he's in a place to do anything like this right now. Uh, I wanna be respectful of that. I will let him know that he's always welcome. And if he ever wants to chat, I would welcome that. Uh, but it's not gonna happen anytime soon. And I just want us all to respect where he's at and his place right now. And, uh, and hopefully um, something will change in the future, but that's, that's not where we're at right now. Um, but I do acknowledge that if it weren't for him, I don't think we'd be here today. Many of you, your first experience of Phantas 2 was watching his playthrough and I, I completely respect that. Okay, so let's not talk about who it isn't gonna be, but let's talk about who it is gonna be. Um, this is going to, uh, I, I'm gonna show you a video that was uh, edited by our very own Daniel Albu, who is the creator of Phantasmagoria 2.1, uh, a mini game that combines elements of, um, uh, the real game, Phantasmagoria 2, and all of the things that we've been doing at, fan, uh, at the Conversations with Curtis. It's on our website. I'm going to put it, I'm going to post it right now. Uh, if you get a chance, please check out this mini game that he's created. It is so much fun. And he's about to drop a whole bunch of new uh, content. Uh, if it's not dropped now, it will be this week. So you got to check it out this week and see all the new stuff. But for without further ado, I am going to play uh, Daniel's edited version that is going to reveal our December guest. Here we go. Where's the mail? I'm usually here by now.
Bridget's Books is proud to welcome best-selling author Adrian Delaney. Ms. Delaney will be signing copies of her latest book, Coping with Loss. And guess what? She'll be joining me this December on Conversations with Curtis. Hmm. She's pretty. That's right. Adrienne herself will be joining me in December. Victoria Hemmingson, who was once Victoria Morsel, who is the actress who played Adrienne, will be my guest. And this will be the first time that the two leads from the two Phantasmagorias will talk to each other about their uh, individual and shared experiences uh, making this game. Super excited. I, I reached out to her and we've had a short to chat on the phone and she just seems lovely. And um, this is the first time she, I don't think she's talked about this in many, many years. She's really been off the grid. She's a writer now and uh, um, super excited to have her. So please keep that in mind. But, uh, we'll have some, you know, uh, we'll, we'll share more information on social media, but that's gonna be happening in December. And so with all this stuff that we're doing, that we've been doing and that we're heading towards, I just wanna say very quickly that we can use your support. Um, the only reason I can do this right now is because I have uh, this incredible group of Patreon members who have been allowing me to do it. I've been getting, because of their support, I can take the time to make all this content to create this. Um, and I really couldn't do it without them. And so I just wanna thank all of you who have been a part of the Patreon club, my win technicians, the thresholders for making this happen. Um, we do lose people, you know, people jump in for a little while and then they have to go. And then, you know, the thing is, is that we hope that we continue to get people. So I am hoping today, especially on a day like today, that for, for those of you who are not members who have been thinking about it and can afford it, I would love for you to join. Um, it would mean a lot. And uh, uh, even for a little while, um, and for those of you who are members who can maybe afford to bump up a little bit, my goal today is if possible, we can get another 10 members uh, before the end of, of today. So please think about it. I'm gonna drop this thing in the, our Patreon message right there. And so please consider it, all right? If you do join, you get a sticker at the $3 level. Uh, at the $10 level, you get stickers and a, uh, a lapel pin. And for anybody who joins at the $20 level, he will get uh, a signed photograph of me, either the cover art or a backstage photo or my 90s headshot you get to choose. So please think about it. I'd appreciate your support. And I certainly appreciate all the support for everybody who is already part of the team. I mean, it means so much. Um, and I wanna do a quick shout out to one of our Patreon members, Kerbin. Uh, he goes by Kerbin on uh, uh, Discord. And uh, he sent me a 3D version of the CWC logo. I couldn't believe it. It is so cool. So thank you so much, Kerbin, for that. I, uh, he also sent me a really great stand to put it on. And so this is proudly living on my desk to remind me to keep moving forward. So thanks so much for that, Kerbin. I appreciate it. Oh, and by the way, uh, Andy, if you're watching, I owe you a photo. And also I owe everybody stickers. I haven't got stickers out to anybody yet. I'm going to do it this week. I promise anybody who sent me a request and their, their, uh, their address, this is the week I'm going to get everything out. So, so apologies for the delay on that. Okay. It's 1118. I said 20 minutes and it's actually 18 minutes. So now is the time we've all been waiting for. I am so, so excited to announce and to bring out my guest today. Lorelai Shannon is the author of a number of books, screenplays, and short stories. She was a designer and screenwriter for numerous games produced by Sierra Online in the 1990s, including Laura Bow, Police Quest, King's Quest VII, and The Reason We Are Here Right Now, Phantasmagoria II, A Puzzle of Flesh, which was released 
exactly 25 years ago today. Please, everyone, join me in welcoming Lorelai Shannon. Hi. Hey there. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Great. How are you? Good. Now, not counting Annie's podcast about nine, 10 months ago, when was the last time we saw each other? Oh, my gosh, a long time ago. <laughs> I mean, I, was it, I think it may have been at the rap party, probably. I, th right? I think it probably was. Yeah, yeah, so it's been 25 years. So yeah, what you yeah. been up to for these last 25 years? Oh, nothing much. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate it, Lorelai. Oh, you bet. Thanks for yeah. having me. Yeah, who would have thought that this, uh, this, and by the way, I feel like I need to change. Hold on a second. I got this thing in the background that's a little too much. So I, I decided that this is going to be my background for today. It's going to be Dr. Harburg's office. This way I can I can ask you all the probing questions. Nice. There nice. You go. Just yeah, don't try not to turn into a into a blob. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Exactly. Um, so yeah, what's your take on um, has your experience, I imagine even more so than mine, uh, has the have you been receiving a sort of waves of responses over the years and how has that been in, in your experience i do um i you know there it's it's amazing that to this day there are a trickle of of emails and letters and things of of just people talking about the game you know younger people who are discovering it for the first time or um people who played it in the 90s and it affected them in some way um, it's all been very positive and I just, I think it's amazing that after all this time, people are still interested in it. In it. Well, what was your, you know, when the game first came out, um, my, you know, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but my, my memory of it was that it was, it was not, it, it didn't have the effect or it didn't have the impact that we had hoped and it didn't quite sell as much. Is that true? Or did you guys, from your perspectives, were you happy with the way it all, uh, uh, rolled out? It, it sold well. It wasn't a massive blockbuster, but it did, it did sell pretty well. I okay. We did okay with it. <laughs> Good. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it just sure, sure seems like it's picked up, uh, you know, it, it just seems like it's found a, a, a deeper appreciation as the years go by. Definitely. Yeah. And we'll get a lot into the reasons for that. Um, but what I'd love to do to start us off, as I have with all the other guests, is I would just like to get to know a little bit about your background, you know, from yourself. And so without going too deep into the weeds, we have a, you know, and this is all just made up. So no one, if you go over three minutes, great. But we have a three minute timer that okay. will be, you won't see it, but there'll be a three minute timer. I'll keep you, I'll, I'll keep you. Uh, but basically, I want to hear your entire life from the moment you were born to <laughs> right now in three minutes or less. Are you ready to give that a shot? Okay, I'm ready. Okay, whenever you're ready, let's do it. Okay, well, I was uh, born in Mesa, Arizona, which was at one point uh, voted the most conservative city in America, which had nothing to do with me. Uh, <laughs> I lived there the first 25 years of my life, um, then uh, moved out to Oakhurst, California, uh, when my husband got a job at Sierra. Um, he was hired as game designer. I was hired shortly thereafter as a writer on Sierra's magazine, Interaction. Um, after about a year of that, uh, I got promoted to game designer, which was super awesome. I uh, started out doing dialogue and uh, some scene work for a number of different games. And uh, then finally got my own, which was awesome. Um, after uh, Sierra moved up to Seattle. Uh, we did too, not with them at that point, but well, I did. Um, my husband had moved on by then, but um, so and then, you know that's where that's where we did uh, Fantas too. And after that, uh, I took some time off to raise my kids. Uh, you may remember at the wrap party, I was pregnant with one who's now a grown twenty-five-year-old human, which is just bizarre. <laughs> um, uh, I was writing the whole time since then. I've gotten into uh, writing historic true crime with my dear friend, uh, Victoria Cosner. And uh, now um, I've got a day job as a technical writer. I still uh, do write on my own. And that's about that. That's fantastic. So tell me, so, so 
Mesa, Arizona. Um, <laughs> I, I, I read a, one of, a fun little bio of yours where you talked about being a, 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 a kid that sort of was outside a lot and, and sort of kept to yourself. And uh, yes, uh, I was a weird little kid. <laughs> weird little kid, like to look, like to play with the, the animals and, and such. Oh, yeah. So I'm wondering if any of those stories, uh, when I think of the Trevor story of throwing the, the potato or, or what have you, were there moments in your life in Arizona where throwing things at bunny rabbits, uh, were any of those stories from, from real life? That was straight up true. That happened at my aunt's house out in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> we really did being a poor, innocent bunny. Oh, that um, is hilarious. Yeah, I I was I was a weird little Wednesday Adams kid. I, I loved all the, the bugs and the creepy crawlies and spent a lot of time checking them out. Of course, in, in Arizona, you don't really spend a lot of time outside in the summer unless you, you know, want to fry. Yeah. So I was kind of always a nocturnal little kid, and I guess I still am to this day. But um, yeah, there there are many uh, wonderful, amazing, strange animals out in the Arizona desert that a kid might encounter walking right. alone. And then uh, when did you realize, and at what point did you really start taking your writing uh, seriously? You know, what was what was the, how did you begin your writing career? Well, I, I always, I'd always written since I was a little kid. It's just something that I love to do. Um, I didn't really, I guess I started taking it seriously. You know, I had sold, I hadn't sold any stories before I moved up to Oakhurst, but once I got there, there was actually a very solid writing community there. Are there other people who worked there? Um, Bridget McKenna, Marty McKenna, um, some of the other um, old time Sierra folks and uh, we started getting together regularly and I got a lot of encouragement and I started writing more seriously um, and I started getting published and that was super fun at the same time I was sort of developing my uh, game writing chops and that's fantastic it was a really great experience and then uh, so yeah tell me a little bit about the Sierra world so you get in there with your your, your husband was a game designer as well mm -hmm. Uh, and then you got in as a writer and then became the, the, the game designer. Um, what, um, what was that, what was the environment like in California before, you know, what was that, what was that like? That seems like it was kind of wild west back then, right? It really was. It was so much fun. Um, we were the, the magazine um, people, we were on the first floor and we were all together sort of in a big bullpen, the writers, uh, the artists, the editors, everybody. And uh uh, Kurt Bush was the guy who ran the department. He was just super fun, super cool guy. Uh, it was a party. We had a great time. Um, you know, we worked hard, but we played hard and we, we all got along. It was just fantastic. And um, most of the game designers worked upstairs. And of course, we, we worked with them constantly because working for the magazine, a lot of times we were interviewing them or talking with them and stuff. And the more I hung around with them and sort of you know became friends and we started brainstorming together and everything the more I realized hey you know I think I could do this um game design today is is super different it's a lot more technical back then it was really close to screenwriting mm -hmm. and, <laughs> which is and you know it's it's a it's an entirely different skill set now um I don't know if the kind of game design I did back then even exists anymore. Well, I'm sure there's somebody who writes out the story for things, but yeah, but it's very different. But it, it was it was lots of fun. Yeah, was uh, and then when you moved to Seattle, did it uh, did it continue? Did it still have that that sense of you guys? It seemed I guess you were in the heyday, right between those, right? So what when mm -hmm. did uh, yeah? Was, what was that like moving up here? It. Um, it was you went from the desert to another kind of desert in California. Yeah. And yeah. then, uh, well, that's not true. Oak, Oakhurst, is that up north? Uh, Oakhurst is kind of right in the center of California. It's in the Sierra Nevadas. It's okay. really beautiful, hilly yeah. country, um, meadows, stuff like that. Just gorgeous. Right. Um, you, yeah, it was beautiful. Um, and then you come up to uh, the northwest and the dark and the rain and all mm -hmm. that. How did that. How did that suit you? Well, I love the weather because after spending the first part of my life in Arizona, um, I mean, 
take a look at my color. I don't tan. I go from white to beet red. <laughs> Me too. I, I have so much. Really white. So mm -hmm. I kind of, I kind of liked, liked the, the, the cool and the rain and all that. Um, the atmosphere changed. It, it wasn't quite as loose and open and, uh, you know, as, as much of a party atmosphere as it had been before. Um, you know, it was still fun, but it, it was definitely different once we moved, uh, yeah. to Seattle. Yeah. Well, Laurel, I have, uh, I have a boatload of questions uh, about <laughs> Phantasmagoria too. Awesome. Uh, not only my own, but many questions from our, our fans, um, and many people, uh, and then later on, we'll actually have some time to do a little bit of a Q and A with the people watching right now. There's, a, and so if you are, uh, for those of you uh, on hold, the, your questions for now. I don't want to lose them, and when I let you know about the uh, the Q and A, we'll we'll sure. puzzle them. So I'm going to start with uh, some of these questions. Are people really wanted to? Uh, say hi to you, and this is the best way I could do it. So we have some recordings here, and the first one comes. The first question of the day comes from our very own Therese herself. Rockness Sigrun, her daughter, has a question for you. Here we go. Hi, Lorelai. I have a question or two, actually. Uh, I would like to know who is your favorite all-time horror movie character, and why. And who is your favorite villain, if it's not the same as the horror? Who is your favorite villain, movie or book? Oh, that's a good one. Oh, it's so awesome to see her again. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's been such a crazy adventure. So, so fun seeing everybody. You'll, you'll see a few more people, too. Um, My favorite horror movie character. Oh. Uh... Well, I mean, it's kind of hard not to love Hannibal Lecter, isn't it? <laughs> He's so witty and charming and entertaining. Um, I always like the Hannibal Lecter. You know, people are going to probably scream at me, but I love the Hannibal Lecter and Manhunter. Um, oh, Brian Cox. Yeah, I thought he was fantastic. I almost liked him more than I liked Anthony Hopkins. Anyways, but yes, oh, he, right. he was great. And what's funny is if you read the books, the character really does kind of evolve he's you know he's different from one book to the next as he develops so he was yeah that was great um <laughs> uh, i'm also on on the uh on the supernatural side i'm a big pinhead fan <laughs> okay great oh that's a, that's a, that what the design on that guy is just stunning right that's Isn't it great the most oh, all the thing. cenobites just beautiful yeah really great character yeah. um so when you're um so can you talk a little bit about your the games before we get to Phantasm One? How how what what was your trajectory? Like how did it get you? You you know you were a writer on some games. Did you design other games? And then how did it work its way to? How did you end up getting the job for Phantas Two? Well, um, I started out uh, helping out with dialogue on uh, games like uh, Laura Bow Two. That was a lot of fun. Um, I was also, this is so funny, ferret motion consultant <laughs> because I was the only person there with ferrets. They're totally illegal in California. I just, I smuggled them in when I moved from Arizona and, and uh, yep, I, I was a uh, ferret outlaw back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> but after doing, um, I did some dialogue for that. I did some for Police Quest, um, had a lot of fun with it. Um, Jane Jensen was working on um, uh, Pepper's Adventures of Time, which was a fun little kind of a edutainment game, way more tainment than edu, but that's okay. And um, I actually got to design a bit of that, some of the some of the puzzles and situations and stuff, and that that was fun. Um, then uh, you know when Phantasmagoria, you know, was very successful and we wanted to do a second one. Were you involved in the first one? Um, I wasn't directly involved in the first one. I was there for some of the filming and, um, and stuff like that. And I, I actually wrote the hint book for the first one. Oh, wow. So, wow. yeah. So I was, I was around a lot and I interviewed, you know, people and everything and you're, you're in for a treat with Victoria. She is wonderful. Oh, good. You're going to love her. Oh, I can't wait. But uh, yeah, she's great. 
but basically um, they just, they kept giving me a little bit, you know, more and more responsibility and I kept loving it and hopefully rocking it. And there were a number of proposals for Fantas 2 from different, different folks. And they were, in my opinion, all equally wonderful. Um, there were, there was a Cannibal Hillbilly proposal, which I'm always a big fan of Cannibal Hillbillies. Gotta get <laughs> yeah, there were serial killer proposals. Um, mine, I wanted to do something because, you know, they, they, they had told us that we were not doing a sequel sequel, that it was going to be, it was pictured as an anthology type series where everything would be different. It's horror and that's all it's got to do with it. And I've always been a big fan of cosmic horror. And so I wanted to kind of combine the idea of a very personal story, you know, this, this poor guy who's just trying to live his life um, with all this weird, you know, emotional and mental stuff going on that he doesn't, he doesn't even know what the origin of it is with this larger cosmic, we've opened another dimension kind of stuff. And um, that's the one they went with. So oh, that's so great. <laughs> well, good. I'm going to uh, play another uh, question here from our Patreon member, uh, Alberto. And I think he talks a little bit about, I, I think people are very curious about the, uh, the, some of the stylistic differences between the two. two sure. games. Hey, Paul. So I heard that you have a uh, lot of lie with you today. And actually, there's something that I would like to ask her. Um, basically, what I would like to know is how come uh, Fantas 2 is so different from the first game? Oh, well, yeah, basically what, what I mentioned earlier, um, I, you know, we wanted to take it in an entirely different direction. Um, it was originally planned to be a, you know, a series, it wasn't going to end at just two, we were going to continue to do horror games and we wanted each one to be really different. And Phantas One is such classic horror, you know, the haunted house and, and all that stuff, which is wonderful. I mean, I love, I absolutely love that genre of horror. But when I was writing my proposal, I thought, well, what's the farthest thing I can get from, you know, a haunted house and a tormented family? Well, work is another kind of tormented family. <laughs> so I, I decided to go in that direction. That's funny. Where you, you, you know, you were all in that same way. I mean, I remember going into those offices uh, that you, because it was pretty close to the, the studio. So I think there mm -hmm. were times that I went in and at a meeting or something, or I, I forgot why, but I went into the office a couple of times. And uh, so I can see where maybe some of that, your personal work world got, you know, you had fun sort of taking that into putting it into the game. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And then also in terms of, were you also adamant about the, the different, you know, where with Fantas one, they were all green screen. It was very, you know, and, and so were you, whose idea was it to go with like this filmic quality, uh, you know, with the sets as opposed to green screen and really making this more of a, of a movie like experience. I know that you and Andy worked hand in hand, but I'm curious, was that something you were adamant about or? No, that was more something Andy was adamant about. He was a really strong creative force on the game. And um, he had some really great visions for it that I think came through really well. Yeah, it sure made it a lot. I, I imagine it was, I felt because you had created a world that we were living in, a 3D world that we were actually living in, it was so much easier to, you, we were there. And so it was easy to be in that world where I imagine where Victoria and the actors, David, you know, where they're just green screen having to remember, you know, pretend everything must have been a lot harder for them. That's gotta be such a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, Alberto, by the way, if so, just so you know, people, we are all over the world. I mean, our fans are are everywhere. It's fascinating how much you know, how much territory we have covered with this game. Um, so it's so uh, Alberto also asked, and I think people probably asked you this before. Who, who came up with the idea of the title, A Puzzle of Flesh, and why? How, how did that come about, and why? Oh gosh, we we spent a lot of time on the title, brainstorming, trying to come up with something that was. Uh, both compelling, descriptive, and mysterious. And that that was sort of just sort of the product of many hours of, of throwing out one thing after another after another and sort of hammering on it. I really I liked Puzzle of Flesh because um, 
you know, it implies body horror and uh, maybe a little bit of sexuality and it's also creepy. <laughs> I kind of like, I think it's a good title. I, oh, I do too, absolutely. Um, let's see here, I got a couple other things. Was any, oh, so Leonardo uh, asks, my question would be, which do you prefer as a game designer, Jane Jensen or Roberta Williams? Oh, well, they're both, they're both wonderful in their own way. Um, you know, R Roberta really is kind of the, the, the queen of, of the sort of fairy tale based fantasy game. Um, you know, that's, I think, what she does best. Um, Jane is an amazing storyteller. And um, of course, being a horror person, you know, I appreciate her dark perspective. So I, you know, I think they're both terrific. Oh, great, great. And then what, do you have a, do you have a favorite game? A game that you, that, you know, do you play games or did you ever play games? I did. I haven't in a while just because, you know, life catches up and there's so much to do. But I remember back in the day, one of my, one of actually a lot of us played uh, Harvester, which is a, do you remember that one? No, I, I, I know game. of it. I, I am such a, I, I'm playing my I'm playing Fantas for the very first time ever. I've never, oh, awesome. I've never played it. I didn't have the capacity, and I was also like horrified about watching myself nonstop for however many hours. <laughs> um, so no, I'm not a gamer, and I'm just now this world, this this project is, you know, uh, is bringing me into this world. I I knew very little about. Yeah, but I've heard of Harvester. Harvester was a sort of a rural horror game around the same time as as Fantas and all this, and it's just. It's super fun. The writing is really fun. It was very gory for the time. Um, it was kind of inspiring to me to see, you know, to see a horror story played out in the venue of a game, which yeah. that was very cool. Nice, nice. All right, I'm going to move on to our Patreon member. Malika has a question for you. Hey, Lorelai. Well, I'm going to make sure I don't jump ahead too fast. Let's try it real fast. Here we go. Hey, Lorelai. I'd love to know more about your experiences and the differences in experiences between working on Phantasmagoria 2 and uh, King's Quest 7. I loved King's Quest 7 growing up, but it's a it's a wholly animated game versus full motion video in Phantasmagoria 2, so that must have presented some fun and interesting challenges. I'd love to hear about them. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Well, that it was they were an entirely different process. Um, Writing Phantas 2 was mostly me sitting there and hammering out the script and the puzzles and things like that. And, you know, I, I fully admit that the puzzles in Phantas 2 are not the best. I mean, it's <laughs> definitely more of a story with puzzles than it is a full on game. And I'm, you know, you, you'll run into there are a lot of Let's Players who, um, you know, make fun of it and you know what that is totally legit i get that because i am probably not the best puzzle designer um but it was a lot of fun now Fantas 2 was a lot more uh I, I was actually sitting across the table from roberta williams hammering out the plot and the puzzles and she of course is a master of puzzles so you know, there, there are probably a lot more um, puzzles that are a little more complex and dense in that one. And um, it, that was very fun because we would spend the day, you know, talking about it. And then I would go back home and write, write up what we had talked about. So I'm going to say that Fantas is probably a more solitary writing process. Yeah. 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 Well, do you, do you, uh, are you still in touch with Roberta and Ken? Do you? No, no? unfortunately. <laughs> I've heard rumor has it, or I guess it's not even a rumor anymore, but the, the news is, is that they're, I guess they're going to be coming out with a new game sometime soon. They, really? They, That's yeah. so cool. Yeah, Last so. I heard they were what, cruising around the Caribbean or something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, um, uh, Many people want to know, uh, MDQP, but he, he's the one who wrote it, wants to know where the story came from. Where, you know, I know that you, you had it, but what do you remember the origins of, of Curtis's journey? Um, well, it was, it was basically, I wanted to, you know, I, I think some of the very best horror starts with taking a person in an ordinary situation and having the situation 
spins fully out of control. So that's kind of what I wanted to go with. Um, I've always liked the idea of doppelgangers and imposters and that kind of a thing. Um, so I, I had sort of a collection of ideas in my head, you know, this hapless young man just trying to live his life. Things keep going wrong. Um, you know, people blame him, uh, potentially uh, mental illness, but it's something else. Uh, the idea of cosmic horror, the idea of having a double somewhere and all that just sort of stirred around in my head. And I, I did a, a number of treatments and drafts um, until I finally came up with the, the whole idea that, you know, the, the, the dude had actually been replaced <laughs> as a child. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And then, and then when it gets to, you know, was it your, were you encouraged to, to not hold back when it came to, uh, you know, the sexuality, the identity, uh, you know, yes. just, the, were you encouraged to do that? Or is that something you had to fight for? No, I, I was actually encouraged to do that. At that point, um, Ken Williams said, uh, uh, this is a paraphrase, not a direct quote, but something along the lines of nothing is too controversial for phantasmagoria. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, all right, <laughs> nice. Okay, that's, that's wonderful. Well, there's a lot, we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. But um, uh, so here's another question from uh, one of our, our fans, uh, John Magnus, uh, who is someone you may or may not remember, but years ago, about 20 years ago, he reached out to you, he's from Sweden. And he reached out to you, and I guess you had a couple of email exchanges. And in fact, I think you were kind enough to even send him some backstage photos uh, that he's shared, and we were able to show on the on the scene here. So here's his, oh, cool. his question to you. Hello, my name is John Magnus Stavik Vol from Norway. I sent fan emails to Lorelei 20 years ago, <laughs> and then she told me about this character, which was going to give hints to Curtis during the game. Can you tell some more about this character, Lorelei? Thanks, bye. Yeah, I should have said uh, Norway, not, not Sweden. So yeah, he, he had mentioned that you had said something that at some point there would be a hint, like if Curtis might have, there might be a voice from Curtis giving hints or something of that sort. Yeah, we had kind of tossed around the idea of having a sort of a helper character. Uh, we had, yeah, we had gone, we had thought about maybe um, it's Curtis thinking. We had thought that maybe it's an unknown whisper that you don't know who it is. And then you find out later it's Hecatomb. It was just something that we sort of played with the idea and then didn't go with probably because the puzzles aren't that hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, no one could get out of the apartment. I'll tell you that. The, the first... that. <laughs> <laughs> that was, uh, that was, a, that we've, there's been a lot of humor about, you know, people yes. just <laughs> never being able to get out of the apartment because of the, because of Take the sledgehammer. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, yeah. Were there yeah. other plot points or characters or you know do you remember things that just ultimately didn't make it into the script or into the final shooting script that you um oh sure sure yeah. um curtis's escape from the hospital was supposed to be a lot more than it was um it there were going to be he was going to be um you know battling both human adversaries and um various manifestations of Hecatomb is going to there are going to be a couple of different puzzles basically we just ran out of time and money for that yeah well also um, do I, I recall didn't the the hot we had like booked the the hospital Harborview I think it was um for a number of days and then they came to us like the day we got there and said you have you have a day we got like yeah. we had one day and we everything was you know, we had to yeah. scramble and figure everything out, right? Yep. So there was a scramble for that. Um, then, you know, we had moved over to Madigan, which was awesome. But again, you know, that's, it's a military installation and they only gave us a short amount of time. And I forgot um, about that. Yeah. I forgot yeah. about that place. Yeah. Wasn't it creepy? It was so cool. <laughs> was that where the, was Madigan where we did the, the electroshock or was that, was that? Uh, that, that was Harborview. Okay. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking a little bit. I'm just, just now that you're saying that it's starting to come back a little bit, but yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I remember we had to go through. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I'm going to have like a deja vu moment as I, as we talk about this. Um, 
Cool. Uh, let's see. Well, you know, can you talk, talk to me a little bit about the casting process? Do you remember what were you? I'm sure you sat in on everything. What do you remember? Oh, yeah, about, yeah, yeah. That that was just that was so much fun. Um, probably like like most um, casting sessions. You know, we started out with headshots, just looking at various people and and like that. And um, you know, from there we looked at. Um, I think we looked at some audition tapes. Uh, we had some live auditions. You went down to uh, LA, right? In LA, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was that was amazing to be part of something like that. It was mm -hmm. just so cool, and there were so many good people who auditioned. It's like I want to cast everybody. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, now I maintain, and I'm ninety nine point nine percent sure that um, you had cast a Curtis. Do you remember that? The, do you remember the other actor that was originally cast before? Either he dropped out or something? Well, we had been talking to, and oh, this is horrible because his name is dropped straight out of my head. But uh, the actor who played the um, college student who's hit by a car at the start of Pet Cemetery. And um, yeah, oh we, yeah, which was cool. And we, we, I don't think we had actually signed him. We had been talking to him. And then he had another commitment. Um, and, but I'm so glad we got you. You were <laughs> well, What do you remember about, because I, yeah, I've said, I've told the story a number of times on these uh, the, uh, episodes, but, uh, but I, I know that I came in kind of late that whoever it was that you had. So it was a pretty quick process for me up in here mm -hmm. in, in Seattle. But uh, do you remember the, the, the Seattle auditions. Do you remember uh, us meeting for the first time? Or I do, I do. Yeah. Tell yeah. me your your thoughts. I'm curious what you remember about that day. I just, I was impressed with how fast you dropped into the character. You were very serious about it, and I just, I saw something in you. I, I said I was thinking that you were just very dedicated, and your performance was really. True. It, yeah. You know, even though we were doing a video game, I wanted to have really seriously good performances and we yeah. thought you were awesome. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah, it was one of those things where I mean, I was probably felt too serious at the time trying to you know, <laughs> get my career going. But this felt not being a gamer, not knowing anything about games, but you guys, you had created what really felt like a movie. You know, <laughs> so to me, I felt like I was making a movie. I, it couldn't have been anything else, really, because you had created mm -hmm. a a story that had a beginning, a middle, and end. It had some interesting little short little scenes because of the nature of of the game. But yeah, I've, I it's taken me years to stop calling it a movie and to go back to calling it a game. You know, it's always <laughs> felt like a that. Um, and then what about you know on the set or during? As I know, um, you know, was there ever any creative? And tell me a little bit about your relationship with Andy and how you guys worked together. Oh, we were super good buddies, uh, super tight. We worked together really, really well. We occasionally had creative differences, but we always hashed them out. Um, you know, it never really got heated or anything like that. Um, sometimes it got enthusiastic where we're both presenting our, our point of view, but we respected each other a lot. Right. So there, you know, we never had any problems or anything. I always we, thought that his vision was just super fantastic. Well, we've talked, you know, and he came on last month and, uh, uh, you know, and I think we've, all, everybody who remembers him, he was just like, he was the big, he was the, you know, he was just the glue. He was such a sweetheart of a person. Yes. He's as, a wonderful guy. As crazy as it got. And I think that he had so many things coming at him from so many different places. He just had this ability to keep it light, you know, have, you know, just, yeah, I, I really, you know, he really made, maintained a wonderful atmosphere on that oh, set. Yeah. And he's um, so funny. I mean, he yeah. could always make you laugh. If you're starting to get stressed out, he was the guy to talk to. Yeah, for sure. Now you brought in a producer that wasn't from Sierra. So that was kind of new, Matthew Thornton. That was our producer. And I remember, you know, Matthew was a kind of slick. You know, I remember he was, when, when, we, when I got cast, there was, uh, he took me and maybe it was Monique. I don't think it was Monique because she was down in LA, but I remember being like wined and dined a little bit, taken to a nice restaurant. And, uh, um, and he was a very, 
very nice person, but I also got the sense that he was playing the role of producer. I'm not sure how much he had done, but do you remember <clears throat> remember him and what what was what, what you know any of the details there? My mom always told me if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get into it too, but I, I remember there was some. Yeah, that was that was the one. There was a lot of conflict. Yes, conflict. <laughs> right, and I, I you know to, to what I remember is that he was also looking at the budget and how much we were spending and going oh no and and yet I also think that maybe he could have handled that better and uh, but I do remember as the shoot went on right it got more and more stressful uh, it did, it yeah. did. yeah so uh, and I remember uh, in fact I do remember you were pregnant during the that that whole time so you were coming yes. on you know you're yeah. trying to rewrite and get things going and all that and we'll talk a little bit about the uh, the ending um which everybody is very yeah, let's dive into this right now. So, so what do you remember about the ending of the game? Because we had to rush through it so quickly. Were there things in there that you just broke your heart that we couldn't get to? Um, oh, there was a lot that was supposed to happen um, in the alien world. A lot more ex exploration, um, a couple more puzzles. That whole thing ended up being very rushed. But, you know, I think that our artists, I had been booted off the project by then. <laughs> I was not there for the end. But I've got to say that our artists did a fantastic job um, of creating the world uh, with what they had. Um, Andy did a fantastic job of sort of navigating how to put it together. Um, you know, it, it's, it came out really well. And yeah, it sure I'm did. Proud of it. Um, all right, a couple more questions from other folks. Uh, if Mitchie would like to know, if Phantasmagoria 2 were to take place today in a post-social media and post-smartphone world, what do you think would be different and do you think it would still work? Um, yeah, I think that it could work. And I think that there would be a whole, there'd be a whole lot more um, electronic and social media components to it probably. I mean, the Hecatomb would have a whole lot more channels to harass poor Curtis through, wouldn't he? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, you also just handled, you know, you you showed people a world that everybody lives right now. Just the your, the way that you handled the the email exchanges and the, I mean, now that I'm playing it, it you really do get this sense of what it's like to be in a cubicle all day and checking <laughs> emails and getting responses and making phone calls and going and getting water. I mean, it really does, it, you know, unless you're playing the game, uh, all I've ever done in the, up until now is just watched the, the movie segments of it. But once you start to play, you really do get this atmosphere you've, you've created. That's really, really neat. Uh, it's fun. To, uh, I'd never experienced that before. Well, um, the script was about 600 pages long because, yeah, because, you know, 90 pages of that probably or so is the start to finish story, but then there's all the supplemental stuff, you know, Curtis gets up and checks his mail and comes back, you know, all that stuff, um, the various email exchanges, all the optional stuff that people could do because it's, you know, so interactive. We tried to make it as interactive as possible. You have to write lots and lots and lots and lots of different possibilities. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, and I remember, I mean, I'm so glad you said that because I remember at one point I had a script that was, it was one of those. And I think that it got pared down that the actors ultimately got the 200 page version. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember at one point seeing a script that was ginormous. And so oh, there sure. was a, yeah, that's crazy. And, and you don't probably, have it anymore. Is that true? You don't have I access don't. to it? I don't. I, yeah, I, I had to turn in everything when I left. And unfortunately, I wasn't sly enough to save a copy. I probably should have. <laughs> right. Um, well, I want to double back a little bit because I'm seeing some responses. But you, you've said being booted off. And without saying, again, I'm not trying to talk bad about anybody. It just, it did, um, it did make a uh, a memory just kind of flashed is that I remember when I came back to do the, there was a, a gap. We, we had mm -hmm. finished principal photography. Clearly there was some stuff going on. Then there was a gap and then I was brought back and like the sets had been almost completely struck. And we had all of a sudden we had this, it was a bizarre um, 
you know, mood. There was hardly anybody there. It was Andy and a few people, you know, it was a skeleton crew. That's mm -hmm. how we ultimately finished the alien world game. And it had this, it, it just had a, a dynamic that wasn't what everything else had been. And I remember not seeing you there. And it was weird to not have you on set for those moments. So, so yeah, it sounds like there were some, some moments that, uh, you know, not, not pleasant yeah. moments near the end there. I was tremendously sick with my pregnancy. Um, I lost like 20 pounds in my first trimester. It seemed like all I did was barf. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was, it was difficult. I wasn't on set for as many hours a day as I wanted and such because I was so sick. And there were, there were some people who took exception to that. Um, you know, there, it was, there was, yeah, that, that was difficult. Um, also, uh, you know, without going into specifics, uh, there were contract issues. Um, and unfortunately, um, some parties on the other side escalated it to the point that basically they, they made the whole thing unworkable and Pretty much, I yeah, I got punted. <laughs> oh man, that's crazy. It was a bummer. <laughs> yeah, tell us about Blob. Oh, she's so sweet. That was my little pet rat, Harley. Um, no, Rosie. I'm sorry. And she was she was such a good little actor and so sweet. She got. I remember that uh, Andy gave her the nickname One Take Rosie. <laughs> He'd bring her out and she'd do her little thing. Um, she was just a very sweet little rat, and I, I would bring her every day with her sister Harley to sort it of was, keep her company. That's right. And yeah. So Harley did not stand in for. No. Okay. No. She was, she was I, just there for moral support. Gotcha. So I do remember two two of them on on set. Yeah, she was great. People love Blob as well they should. There, as you can see with the fan art, Blob oh, yeah. is is everywhere, and uh, you have uh, created an immortal character with that. And, <laughs> How long did you have her? Um, I had her for about three years, which is about average for a rat. They break yeah. your heart. You know, they don't yeah, like yeah. All right. Um, what's some of your? Bigger. We talked a little bit about the, you know, the 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 stuff that we that didn't go as well. Let's talk about some of your favorite memories from the shoot. Anything that sure, uh, sure. comes, well, comes out? I think my favorite blog memory was uh when there the point where curtis looks into her cage and she's uh nibbling down on a heart right well our 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 wonderful special effects person made us this awesome latex heart that was really creepy looking and 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 rosie wanted nothing to do with it i think it smelled funny to her and finally we ended up coating it with uh strawberry glaze and we tucked a few skittles here and there in it <laughs> and then she started licking and pulling at it and i remember andy got just the perfect shot where she had been licking it she bit the latex a little bit and pulled on it and it stretched and it just looked so gross it was perfect <laughs> that's great that's great yeah, that was really fun um i i don't know i had such a great time on set it seemed like everyone was really positive everyone was having a good time uh some of the some of the stuff that took place in between shots was just so much fun. Um, this is going to sound really twisted, but filming the murder scenes could be really, really funny <laughs> because they're so intense. But then, you know, you're doing these weird little short bursts of activity and, you know, the actor will be so keyed up and then you have to come back down. And it, it's, it was just an amazing experience. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody was so committed to it. I remember that, uh, which I thought filmed unbelievably well. The the scene where Curtis is being hunted down by all the, the, the you know dead Trevor and dead Bob and mm -hmm. you know all that and that was they created that incredible set and the the smoke and you know just that was you know again one of those things you had to go to super super high emotion but then it'd be like cut hold on a second we got to get the lighting right and then okay ready go and then you have yeah. to do it again and it was kind of hard to uh, to maintain that uh, for uh, that whole day. Oh yeah. yeah. Is there a favorite moment you have from the game? Is there a moment that just uh, the way that it ultimately was uh, shot, and when you finally saw it, that you just went, "Oh my gosh, that's exactly what I, I was hoping, or better than I hoped." 
Well, I, I think the scene you just mentioned is, is one of my favorites. I think that came out so well. And that kind of scene can go either way because we've seen it before, you know, the protagonist being chased by, you know, these phantoms or whatever. But I think that Andy just did a great job with it. Everybody on set did a great job. It was really cool looking. Oh, good. Okay, a couple more quick questions. And I want to start showing you a little bit of video here. Um, Lucy Gangle asks, my question for Lorelai would be, is our Joss... Is our girl Joss an alien? She's got to be an alien, right? <laughs> you know, I did not imagine her as such, but that would be really cool. I like that idea. <laughs> it's funny. I, I kind of had a little um, aha moment as I was doing prep for all this and Monique joined us. Uh, and then I was looking at a lot of her scenes and I had this moment of like, you know, she is always wanting more from him. She mm -hmm. loves him. And then she's always sort of just there for him. But then when she shows up in the uh, in the threshold, she's just so calm. She says, I know, I know everything. And I had this moment of like, well, maybe she's been in on this the whole time. Maybe she's been a plant by Warner that just to keep him in line and to keep him him there. So, you know, I love that idea. And I, I'm I'm not the kind of writer who uh gets very territorial about the story i think that when other people have amazing ideas they should be incorporated into it. <laughs> I think that's a great thought there's a whole other line to explore there you're right exactly all right i'm gonna read a, a ross scott of accursed farms ross is a uh a wonderful youtuber who does uh these fantastic uh, uh first person narratives of video games and he also does these wonderful S video essays and he did a video essay on uh fantas 2 a couple years ago that was incredibly popular and ross I, has been very helpful for me as i've been sort of putting this thing together he did not have time to put a video together but he did send me this question and i'm going to show <clears throat> i want to actually just to tease him a little bit i'm going to just show a picture of him while <laughs> he, while i read his his question or his comment to you okay here we go Oh, no, that's not it. Let me find it here again. Doing two things at once. All right. Oh, that's okay. Here we go. There he is. Uh, hi, Lorelai. I'm a big fan of the game. I've never played anything like it since. I've only seen one game that I thought was going to be similar, but then it totally fell apart about halfway through. Mm -hmm. Phantasmagoria 2 stands alone. I'm the one to blame if you received a lot of emails about it a couple of years ago. I encourage people to send you a message if they liked it in my video. I'm sure you'll get asked the big questions in this interview, so I just wanted to add some small ones. Number one, do you remember anything particularly funny from production? And two, what are some of your favorite books and movies? So there you go, Ross. That's your picture right there. It could have been your video, but instead, that's where we're at. Okay. <laughs> We talked a little bit about the funny moments, but uh, uh, well, yeah, what is, what, is, there, is there a favorite movie of yours or a favorite book that you, uh, that you like to recommend to folks? Oh, gosh. Um, I, I was like probably everybody else. I did a whole lot of reading during the pandemic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I read, gosh, I read a bunch of their, um, some of the authors I've been reading. Um, Adam, Adam Neville is fantastic. Um, Sylvia Moreno Garcia. I've just been exploring all different kinds of, I mean, I don't, people think I only read horror. I don't, I actually read some other stuff once in a while. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 everybody loves Stephen King. I love Stephen King, but I encourage everybody to go out and check out some, um, some of the other authors that are out there. Uh, if you're not already checking them out, um, check out the website bloodydisgusting.com, bloody-disgusting. They have a lot of book reviews yeah. and uh, you'll find some some good good tips on what, what to read. Um, cool. As for movies, oh, I've seen a lot of good movies. Like, oh, I absolutely loved Candyman. I was delighted that it was actually a sequel and not a reboot. I just thought it was fantastic, so well-made. Um, in the last few years, I've been a big fan of Ari Aster. I love Hereditary. Uh, Midsummer. I'm actually wearing a Midsummer t-shirt today. You can't see it right now, but I do love it. Um, I think that there's just sort of a, a renaissance and horror going on right now. And there's big just time. tons of great stuff out there. Big time. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, Okay, um, I'm going to uh, read uh, Maniac536 wrote, I'm curious how she reacted when she found out what she had to wear for her cameo. Now, before we, we uh, had get your reaction to that, I thought it would be, you actually have two cameos in the, in the game. I do. And I have, I have tracked them down. So let's watch, <laughs> let's watch the first one here. No, sick, sick and wrong. So there's the first moment when during the, uh, I guess if I'm not mistaken, was the um, was the insane asylum populated with uh, workers from Sierra Online? Yes, yes, it was. <laughs> it was all you guys just getting a chance to get out and get some stuff done. So here's another little moment from the from this room. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> that was so much fun so you gave yourself the character who says no yes <laughs> <laughs> that's great and then here's the other one i think he was talking about this is this is a great moment it happens very quickly right there <laughs> yep that's me <laughs> that's you so he wanted to know how you felt with this cameo, probably the other one. So how did uh, how did that come about? Did you choose that for yourself or how did that all work out? I absolutely did. Um, the, um, that was, uh, the, the club was called the Catwalk and um, it was a really, really fun kind of um, kinky BDSME sort of club around town that, that everybody liked. And I actually had that latex dress before. Now, mind you, I don't know how much you can tell in that, but I was actually pregnant wearing that thing. And I kind of felt like an avocado. I was <laughs> just this weird, shiny pear thing, but it was, it was so much fun. And I thought that we sort of created a really fun atmosphere there. You did. You know, it's funny. You call it, I remember when you the catwalk, I always thought it was the weathered wall. It's the, it's what. Oh, um, I remember the catwalk, but that's, was that, I Did thought we were at the catwalk. Well, that's right. That's right. I mean, it was so long ago, but I, I, I've been calling it the weathered wall forever. But, but now that you say catwalk, I'm like, oh, that sounds familiar too. Did we shoot at the catwalk as well? Or did we just talk to them? Gosh, I don't know. It's been yeah. so long. Yeah, right, right. Of course. Okay. That's great. Well, um, the weathered wall was the restaurant, um, wasn't it? I thought the, I thought the restaurant was kind of a closed down, uh, like that it's had like been. A, closed Italian place Italian or Mexican yeah, restaurant yeah. I thought yeah that had been you know we we got, got a chance to use it so yeah. um <laughs> well I've got plenty more here how are you doing do you would you be willing to stick around for I mean can we do another another 45 minutes or so sure do, do you have um do you want to take a quick little break and come back in about a minute or two or how you how you doing I'm I'm good. I've got okay. my soda. I've got my water. Hang okay, in. good. All right, I might need to take a break in a couple, in a little bit. Fair I want to I want to share with you. Um, uh, so uh, another YouTuber uh, goes by Void Burger. Did an if you haven't seen this, Laura, like you really need to. She made an incredible video essay on the sexuality and the and the uh, sexual identity and bisexuality in the in the in the game. Awesome. Movie, and how progressive it was and what. Uh, you know, how unlike anything it's ever been in, uh, in games back then, and even today. And so uh, her essay is wonderful. If you get a chance, you should check it out. But uh, she was one of my guests a few episodes back, and uh, she has this question for you. Here we go. Hello, Laura Lai. Very excited to ask you my question. Um, I wanted to ask about the therapy scenes because they're great and the frank acceptance of the therapist with regards to Curtis's um, sexuality was unexpectedly really cool and it was not something you would see usually uh, during the 90s. Um, and also like just therapy being treated like, you know, a normal good thing to be doing and not something for crazy people was also something you didn't see very often at the time. Were you purposefully, you know, writing those scenes with the objective of destigmatizing both queerness and therapy? Uh, or was this kind of just like, not a happy accident, but you know, not something you were specifically aiming to do. Um, but regardless of your answer, thank you for doing that. Thank you for writing it that way. It had quite an impact on a lot of fans, a lot of bisexuals like me. 
Um, and I really appreciate that you even did that in the first place. Very, very cool. Thank you. Hope you're well. Bye. That is a great question. And, you know, I actually was trying to destigmatize that. Um, I am uh, bisexual. Um, I am poly and I have mental illness struggles. I have depression and anxiety and like that. Um, you know, all these are things that have been part of my life for many, many years. And I think that I wanted, you know, I wanted to communicate that one, none of this is something that anyone should be ashamed of. And two, um, I think that including that kind of personal content maybe made the whole thing a little more authentic feeling, hopefully. Um, uh, yeah, the therapist was kind of, I, I, she was kind of my dream therapist. Up until that point, I had never had good luck with therapy. And I was like, what if there was a therapist that just accepted you? <laughs> so I kind of- so You made her, you, you created her. Yep. <laughs> oh, that's that's amazing. That's wonderful. You know, and it, it's, it's uh, I, I don't, I know that I, I didn't realize the impact that you had um, until much later. You know, I, 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 as I mentioned before, you know, growing up, working in the theater in a very liberal environment with with all kinds of different personalities and sexualities it's just something i've always been around i've never really uh, it's just it's been an accepting it's something i've accepted i didn't realize that you know, not being a gamer that you're taking this into a world that many people have never heard anything positive and so you've created, you know, for many people who have commented to us uh, over the months, this was the first time they ever heard that it's okay to be different, that it's okay not to be what's expected of you. And that, and uh, it, it had a profound effect on a lot of people. Um, and this is why this game is still talked about. Those are my favorite emails I get. I absolutely love it. When I get an email saying, you know, I played this when I was a teenager and it made me feel less alone. Um, if I if I don't do anything else in my life, I'm really pleased if I helped anybody with their personal struggle that way. That makes me so happy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, someone just wrote, I'm so happy. Uh, I'm a mental health therapist. This game came out in my teens and it was definitely a vision of the type of therapist I wanted to be. So not only that, you actually helped you know, not only did you create Dr. Harburg, but you created a real person to, that, that wanted to be like Dr. Harburg, a real That's therapist. That's so awesome. So, isn't that amazing? <laughs> well, let's look at a little bit. I've, I've talked forever and we haven't shared any, really hardly any of these scenes in these um, episodes, but I've maintained since the day I read this script that the scenes that I loved the most were the scenes in, with the therapist. And I just thought they were the most beautifully written. They were so much fun to act. Uh, Cynthia Steele, who played the uh, the therapist was wonderful. She was great. Uh, the if you look at the, you know, it's just in an office, this office right here, but the lighting that they created, the the way that they had the camera move throughout, it's just there's everything about it. So let's watch a couple of scenes from uh, from the from the game and, and talk a little bit about it. So here's here's Curtis sharing uh, the company Christmas party photo. Mm -hmm. Of course, I did the wrong one. Here we go. This was taken at our company Christmas party. I had a lot of fun that night, I guess. <laughs> Looks like you were having fun. <laughs> Oops, I'm gonna just stop a little bit. I love how the camera just, they, they, again, they just they kept it so simple where the camera's just going behind her as That's he's talking. Nice you know? Yeah. It's beautiful. Fun that night, I guess. <laughs> Looks like you were having fun. <laughs> Who are those people with you? Uh, it's, um, that's Trevor, he's my best friend. And that's Jocelyn, she's my, um, my lover yeah it's funny I I've been keeping our work at our relationship at work a secret are you in love with Jocelyn I remember uh that was a I, I screwed that lineup and uh and I love that Andy loved the awkwardness of it and he kept that in as the you know that was I was supposed to just say I was keeping our relationship at work a secret. I, I mixed, missed it up, but he decided to keep that. I thought that was really neat. Oh, it's great. Yeah. It's very real. Yeah, I think so. But 
I'm, uh, I'm kind of uh, attracted to Trevor. And that worries me because I've never, I mean, I don't want to, I don't know if I should be with Jocelyn. I, I don't want to hurt her, you know? Have you spoken to Jocelyn about this? God, no. I have enough trouble opening up to her. You know, it's funny, even when we're making love, I don't feel totally close to her. I don't think I felt totally close to anyone. So there are so many moments in that that I, I, I can point to. Um, and the first thing, even when I read the script, it really surprised me is that when he says, I'm attracted to Trevor, and then he immediately goes, I, and I don't, and I was expecting him to say, and I've never felt this way about a guy, or I don't know what, uh, what these feelings are, or maybe that's wrong, or I'm not gay or, or whatever. And the thing is there, he doesn't say a single thing bad about his feeling for Trevor. The only thing he feels bad about is how it's going to affect his relationship with Jocelyn. Yeah. And then her response is, well, did you talk to her about it? They don't talk about, it's a non-issue. Mm -hmm. And and I think that this is what you're talking about, that, that this is, and this is what so many people are responding to. Not that it was a big statement like, you're okay and everything's fine. It was just, they didn't turn it into, this game never, ever made fun. This game never, ever uh, commented on these, you know, the BDSM world. It was, it was all about acceptance. It was just, it was what it was. And uh, I think that's just fascinating. Well, I, I, what I, I, what I like about Curtis and Teresa's relationship is, you know, Teresa's portrayed as kind of a dangerous character, but the fact is she's, she's not dangerous at all. She's just a BDSMer who lives a little, you know, she, she does a few creepy things like breaking into his apartment and stuff, but, but I, I wanted to present the fact it's like, okay, on the surface, this may seem weird and different, but it's really not, you know, what's weird and different is the alien world. <laughs> right, right. And then here's a couple more little scenes in the um, doctor's office that just really had, these are, these are the things that people have said to me over the last many months that that had real impact on them and here's here's another i am um, i have a date with this girl for my work tonight her name's therese she is very sexy and uh i don't know though i'm feeling feeling guilty because of my girlfriend jocelyn well do you feel like you're betraying jocelyn yeah well I mean, no, I mean, okay, we, we agreed from the beginning that it wasn't exclusive, right? So I don't have any reason to be guilty at all, do I? Well, I think that's for you to decide in your own mind and in your own heart. But let me point out, however, Curtis, that, that guilt is a very, very destructive emotion. So that, that moment right there, again, no judgment, but talking about guilt. And, and I'm curious where, was that... Ye, is that something someone shared with you, Lorelai, or is that something that you needed to, to to find out on your own and share with others? Um, that's something that I sort of came to acknowledge on my own. Um, you know, and unless you've done something truly heinous, like killing someone and burying them in your backyard, <laughs> guilt is mostly just negative and destructive and not a good thing at all. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I've got two more little short scenes here. By the way, many people, and myself included, have commented on your Vincent Price uh, photos in the background. Is that, oh, is that, is yes, that Vincent, Vincent back there? Price yeah. back there and uh, David Lynch. Those are done by an amazing artist named Langley J. West. He is just fantastic. Oh, man, they're awesome. That's so <laughs> cool. I love it. All right. One more, two more little scenes in the in the doctor's office here. Kind of embarrassing, but uh, that kind of imagery has always fascinated me. It's nothing to be ashamed of, Curtis. Have you ever thought about why you like images of bondage? Yeah. It's even weirder. I I feel like the uh, the person in the picture is somehow being held together, 
like um, they can't come apart with all that stuff holding them in. Hmm. Fascinating. So tell us a little bit about, I mean, this sounds, does this come from a personal place with, 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 I mean, I love that, that imagery of that, those, you know, that, uh, the, what he ends up wearing with, with Therese, uh, later on, um, this, this thing that's holding him together. It's almost like a security blanket, but it's this mm -hmm. also it, 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 it's pleasure and pain. Right. Yeah. And so what is it about, uh, what, what made you incorporate that into Fantastia? What did, was that just a natural extension or I'm curious where you I thought it was a, a natural extension. Um, the kink community in Seattle was really lively and fun in the 90s. And I talked to, you know, I, I wanted to approach it from a very naturalistic angle, not a lurid angle. And, and I ended up talking to lots and lots and lots of people about why they were into it and what they liked about it and that sort of thing. And I thought about, you know, what, what would attract Curtis to it? And from a guy who feels completely out of control, um, you know, being controlled for a while is probably very comforting. Um, and he kind of views bondage as like a, what are those thingies you put on your scared puppy? A thunder shirt. <laughs> it's like he's wrapped <laughs> in it. <laughs> right, right. Oh, that's amazing. And, and then, you know, uh, there, there are millions of reasons why people are into it. And I just, I decided that that was his reason. <laughs> that's fantastic. That's great. And it was, uh, um, okay. And then our final scene for the doctor's office. And then, and then at this point, I'm going to, I need to take a two minute break. And then we'll just, we'll put up a little be back soon sign and then we'll have some live Q and A and then, uh, and then we'll find out what you're doing now. And then, and then we'll wrap up. So let's watch right. this last scene here. This is going to sound really twisted, but sometimes I wish I could just live with Jocelyn and Trevor both, you know, somewhere far away where no one would judge us and we wouldn't have to see another person. Many people have fantasies like that, Curtis. Just because it isn't standard behavior in our society doesn't make it wrong. So yeah, a couple of moments in there that like, you know, A, that fantasy of Jocelyn and Trevor. Um, I think a lot of people have talked about that. And, and uh, uh, do you think that that could ever have been a reality in, the, in, in Curtis's world? Well, sure. I think that, um, that that's, that's something that, you know, if you, if you look at it from a Jacob's Ladder point of view, where reality shoots off in all different directions, I think that could have been an alternate reality right. for them. Um, I don't think anyone was even using the word thruple back then no <laughs> but no. i did i did know some and um yeah i think that that could have been that could yeah. have been an alternative ending for him yeah i've always you know the more i look at this what i what what fascinates me is that um trevor i the reason i would say it probably wouldn't work is that i think trevor is is more well adjusted i think he, you know I, I feel like trevor is sees that curtis is struggling mm -hmm. and and offering Curtis physical love or you know romance or what have you isn't what's necessary for their friendship. And so I've never got the sense that Trevor was flat out flirting or trying to get, yeah. you know, I felt like Kurt, Trevor was by far the most grounded, yeah. normal, helpful kind person in the other than maybe dr harvard but she was being paid to do do her job uh so i just i don't know if it would have worked because i think trevor would have seen red flags all over the place and said let's you know it would take quite a while to you're absolutely to right and he doesn't have any personal connection really with jocelyn um and he's he he doesn't seem to me to be the kind of i want to live out in the country with my lovers kind of guy you know yeah. more, more of a city guy you're right from his perspective perspective it probably wouldn't have worked in the long run at all yeah um, absolutely all right so uh Jason if you don't mind let's do a little two minute um uh a two minute be right back and everybody if you don't mind hanging out for just a couple more minutes we'll be back and we'll 
and we'll uh, continue and we'll do a live Q&A. So uh, now would be the time to put some of your questions down and we'll go from there. All right, we'll see you in just a minute or two. Thanks, guys. assuming I'm going to give them a second here. I'll just you know what I'm going to do. There we go. Okay. We're good to go. Awesome. Okay. Good. Thanks for coming. All right. Good. Woo, feel better now. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks for coming back. And uh, we're going to do some live Q and A. So we'll spend about five, 10 minutes answering any questions you guys might have. I think Gary Spinrad might be in the, in the chat. Uh, oh my gosh. Lorelei. Yeah. There he is. Hi Gary. Going, Gary. Yeah, good to see you. All right, let's see. Uh, let me see if I can move things around a little bit, find the questions. How did you come up with the character death scenes and which is most memorable to you? <laughs> um, the character death scenes. Um, I am a longtime horror fan and I am a gore hound, um, not really in the sense that I want to watch people die, I'm super interested in the effects. When I'm watching a horror movie and I see a gruesome death, I'm like, ooh, how'd they do that? That's so cool. So I wanted to come up with deaths that were spectacular and gruesome, but also doable from a practical sense. And we had a lot of fun with it. I think that the one I remember the most was Bob's death because it was so funny we had so much fun on that set um he was running around with this horrible giant you know gash makeup on his chest and we, we just had a grand time on that one <laughs> right um <clears throat> heather uh, wrote as someone who struggled with sexuality in school and discovered i was gender non-conforming over the course of many years and troubles i'm glad mm -hmm. I, a game i fell in love with was positive about this sort of stuff. So again, this has been what we've been hearing a lot of. Uh, Snoops wants to know, does Lorelai, he's got a bunch here, let's see. Uh, does Lorelai remember roughly what the budget was? I don't. <laughs> yeah, I, I've heard anywhere between 4.5 million up to 7 million, but I don't know if any of that. <coughs> I know it ballooned beyond what they wanted it to. Yeah. Uh, did Lorelai purposely write Curtis as being often an insensitive jerk to Jocelyn? 
um, I didn't see him as an insensitive jerk. I saw him as a guy who, you know, being an, a being basically a replicant type character. I think he has, if not empathy issues, he has some human connection issues. So I didn't write him to be a jerk. I, I wrote him as perhaps he didn't always understand the unspoken language she was trying to speak with him. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Ross at Accursed Farms in all caps is saying, what was the original ending? Tell us everything on Dimension X. They wanna know <laughs> all the things. Well, it was never fully developed, uh, but there, there was a lot more to it. Um, there were more things to explore. Uh, we had originally kind of seen it as uh, one of my favorite movies growing up as a little kid was, um, oh, and now I'm going to block out on it, but it's the 1950s movie where they're cruising around inside somebody's body in a space pod. So I kind of- Oh, Body it Snatchers. In, Is it Body Snatchers? No, it wasn't, it wasn't Body Snatchers, um, but I, we kind of saw the alien world as the shapes and stuff in there, almost like cells and um, you know nerve cells and weird things like that. So it was- it was sort of a lot more organic and gooey. Um, there were some puzzles having to do with uh, getting out, extracting yourself from this and that and the other thing. You know, the ending was was very much the same. It just, it, that that section was going to be a lot more expanded. Did I remember hearing somebody say, and I don't know if I ever read this, but was there ever a, maybe Andy said this, was there ever a moment in the early script where Curtis was supposed to swim some sort of was there some yes water yes. thing um we originally viewed it as being almost um the entire world is filled with almost like a gel and you sort of you float through it you don't walk you float and of course you know that's a little impractical we had already hauled you up in the air at least once <laughs> <laughs> doing it again probably would have been a little mean it would have looked cool though do you remember that forklift they had to bring in to grab me go up? That was hysterical. <laughs> I remember that thing coming in and thinking to myself, "Oh my gosh, what have I done to this poor man?" <laughs> oh, that was funny. Yeah, that was. Uh, uh, all right, other things. Lots, so many questions coming in, Lorelai. How do you feel about a transgender reading of the game? The themes of dysphoria that this body is not your body. Um, uh, basically, he said, aren't inherently relayed. Mar said this. As a trans person, I identify with Curtis a lot. So this idea of body transformation or not being in the body you want to be in, right? Absolutely. I That was not in my mind at the time, but I think that is an extremely valid and interesting interpretation of that. Um, my daughter is transgender and you know, I've seen her struggles and everything and, and looking, she wasn't even born when this was made, but looking back on this, it's like, oh my gosh, there are so many similarities. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. Yeah. Isn't that something? Uh, was there anything about the first Phantasmagoria game that inspired you? Um, I really liked uh, Victoria's performance. Uh, I thought she was very sympathetic and also a strong character. And I, I wanted, you know, a, a strong, independent, but vulnerable character, but I thought it would be super interesting to make that character male. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know you've heard of, uh, did you ever watch the, re someone's asking, did you ever watch Spoonie's review? Did you know about this, this very, popular kind of mystery science 3000 uh yes did you watch any of that or see any of that yes i absolutely love it i i am not hypersensitive about stuff like that i i know what's goofy about it what has an age 12 and i know i love that stuff it's wonderful yeah that's great um okay a couple more and then i will scoot on outside of the asylum chase was there anything else that got cut from the game um other than the alien world stuff, probably not that much, not that much. Okay. Any, uh, I remember you at one point said, and I don't want to, well, here's one, uh, probably Richard writes, I'm curious whether Lorelai would write Therese differently now, a bit more safe, sane, consensual, et cetera. For me, that really made the sex stuff feel dark despite intentions. 
No, I probably wouldn't because um, she, <laughs> Teresa's a little bit of an edge lord, and she doesn't necessarily play by the rules of the BDSM world. You know, I, I think that in some ways she's, you know, I, I had said she's not dangerous. She's not horrendously dangerous, but she does push boundaries a little bit, probably more than is acceptable. Um, and she, you know, she was always meant to be sort of an interesting and controversial character. She does not, I want to make it very clear that she does not represent my view of the BDSM community. Um, you know, she's, she's a little out there. <laughs> <laughs> a little, little bit. Um, uh, okay. I'm going to, Oh, someone says, oh, say hello to your daughter for me. That's great. Um, and where was one more? Oh, I, I remember you saying, if I'm telling me correct, maybe I'm wrong, but did you ever, I remember reading, or maybe it was when we were on Annie Christ's podcasts way back when, mm -hmm. where did you say that you, the only regret that you have is, is killing off Trevor? Is that true? Or is that? Uh, that, you... that is true. Um, I'm torn about that. I mean, the reason I regret it is because I absolutely hate it in movies or games or anything where they just kill off the gay character. It's like, mm -hmm. let's kill the gay character. It happens so often. However, I didn't, I never thought of Trevor as the gay character. I thought of him as the best friend character and killing him was the last thing to push Curtis to the absolute edge. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I do regret it because he was such a cool character and, you know, you really, really like him. Um, I think that it was in some ways necessary as a plot device, but now I almost think that I wish I had made a branch where he could have survived it, where it's like in one branch, maybe he dies and in the other one, maybe he doesn't. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, and someone uh, asked, I forgot uh, who it was now, but someone asked, which to you, which ending is canon um maybe alien curtis <laughs> oh really interesting yeah, yeah yeah oh so him staying him stay him yeah. deciding to stay and deciding uh, to stay yeah yeah i feel like that is that feels like the right yeah. that's because then we something you know if there ever was you can't help but wonder what the rest of that life might be like right That's exactly be, yeah exactly and i i like to think that he adapts but maybe right. discovers some hidden talents he's got who knows <laughs> right he could change though he could be a superhero of some that's sort. right that's right there's well, a we whole different about, game there <laughs> yeah right right uh well we talked about uh annie so you and i uh had a short um for the first time and, and ended up going on uh this this podcast a while back by uh, hosted by Annie Christ. Uh, Annie has a video question for you. She did lament that she wasn't able to get into drag for this particular question, but <laughs> I think she looks beautiful either way. And here is her question for you, Lorelai. Okay. Hello, Lorelai, Shannon, Paul Morgan Stetler. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be a part of this awesome thing that you're doing. So I have a question for Lorelai. So both your scripts for Phantasmagoria 2 and your 2004 film, Lover Girl, they have two main things, main components. One is mental health issues, and the second one is sexual identity. So when you wrote these scripts back then, 1996, 2004, uh, these two issues really weren't at the forefront where they are today. They weren't really talked about too much. Um, so now that the times are changing and it's at the forefront of everyone's attitudes and mental health, do you have any scripts that you've been working on? Or do you have anything you've been sitting on for a while and you're like, mm, I'm not ready to share this yet? And if you do, what are they? And if not, please do one. We need more stuff from you. We <laughs> miss your work and your awesome, awesome industrial music you put in everything. Yes. Anyway, happy Thanksgiving. I hope everyone had a great day. Yeah, what are you yeah. sitting on there, Lorelai? Oh, that's a great question. Um, nothing I'm working on currently has directly to do with mental health, but it is something that's always on my mind um, because, you know, of my own and members of my family and just the, you know, the world at large, I think sort of the pandemic gave everybody in the world kind of a mental health crisis. Yeah, for sure. And I'm, I'm really happy that that is coming to the forefront of people's consciousness now. And, 
it's no longer something that people are ashamed of or should be ashamed of. Yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, here's a question that's been asked many times in the chats and I, I'm saving it for Francois, my Patreon from Switzerland. And uh, here's the question on everybody's, everybody's mind. Hello, Paul and everyone. A special welcome to Lorelei. So glad that you are joining us for the grand finale. And thank you for creating this dark and crazy world of uh, Phantasmagoria 2. I learned a lot also about it thanks to your interview in this tragedy guide. Um, and I could share it here with Paul also. Nice. As before, I ask other guests about the possibility of uh, a sequel to Phantasmagoria 2. Would you take part in it? So, um, again, thank you for your time and thanks to Paul for everything. All the best, guys. All right, that's the big question. Would you ever be involved in some version? Could be, you know, there's so many ways it could go in uh, of, of writing some kind of a Fantas 3. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't own the property. Um, I actually don't know who does at this point. I think it's yeah, Activision. Because... Is, is it Activision? I think so, yeah. We They'll probably one. never do anything with it. But yeah. but if somebody did, sure. I definitely, I still feel very connected to those characters. So yeah. Did you um, did you have some ideas? Or, and, you know, not that you have to share them, but were, had you already sort of been plotting away some of the further adventures of Curtis? Not really, but, you know, I, I, did, I did spend a lot of time thinking about whether or not he would be successful now that he knows who he is living life as as a human and i think that i think that he that he would um well yeah kids. he could be having kids too right and then yeah, you know yeah. finding out like what has he given them and there's so many ways it could it could go you know there's i had this idea a while back that i thought whatever phantas 3 would ever be you know whether it's a comic book or <clears throat> that you stay with the tradition of it being a completely different story with a different mm -hmm. person but i thought it would be great that if this person who's on a journey and of course is ultimately on a you know uh, an adventure has to run away from something and gets thrown in some other dimension and in that dimension sort of like a prison that new character runs into curtis and adrian who are stuck in this dimension and that the three of them have to kind of work the, their way out of it and it's just a little part of the game but it's a moment where all three characters have come together. And then once they get out of that puzzle or whatever, the character just goes on to their normal thing. But it would almost be like a cameo having uh, Adrian and Curtis show up. Yeah, I think that'd be kind of fun. Oh, that would be so cool. I am a huge fan of Easter eggs and cameos and like that. that definitely, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so I, my, my idea is like the cameo. Somebody would actually have to write the whole story. To <laughs> happen. So here's someone who has an idea about, um, uh, has a really good idea about maybe a sequel. And you might recognize this person, Lorelai. Well, ah. hey, Lorelai, 25 years. <laughs> so you, uh, you haven't kept in touch. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sure you remember, you know, during those last few crazy days of filming and you know there was a lot of talk about a, a spin-off series for Trevor <laughs> so I've you know I've just kind of kind of been waiting and <laughs> waiting you know um, I've had to turn down a few projects uh, NCIS <laughs> Big Bang Theory but uh, it's okay it's okay I've been um, I've been keeping in shape you know chucking spuds and uh, <laughs> practicing my zombie walk so you know, i'm ready i mean i'm i'm ready so uh you know whenever just uh okay then happy holiday so there you go magnificent well, you know see. okay so in an alternate world where trevor doesn't die i can totally see Trevor and Curtis doing kind of a supernatural thing, traveling the country, battling aliens and hecatombs and weird <laughs> monsters. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, he'd be he'd be the great uh, he would be the great alien uh, fighter. Absolutely. Um, all right, I'm going to show you just a couple little photos that I I didn't find much, and I know that you probably have some in 
in storage somewhere, but I know you moved recently. So let I me just, just show moved. you. I'm sure it's in a box somewhere. <laughs> right. Uh, so let me show you a couple of little photos here. This is the, the cast photo, uh, or not the cast, but the so crew. Awesome. That's all, that's Andy right yep. there. There you are in the back. And then this yep. is all of our, that was very, this very young, very talented camera crew and oh, yeah. lighting and all that stuff. So there's that's that. So great. Here's a great picture of you and Andy and uh, <laughs> Michael. And that's, <laughs> and then uh, let's see. Oh, and you know, Paul, I think I mentioned this to you, but, but of all the people, he found his uh, shooting script. And, and a storage box. So That's it sounds amazing. like the only person that we've come across so far actually uh, is Paul that has scanned uh, the script to us. And so oh, that's awesome. is looks about that big. I think it's about 220 pages. He said, unfortunately, all the Trevor scenes are uh, excised because he used them to pull them on the, sure, on the, sure. on the script. So, um, so we do have this. I don't know what we can do with it. Um, if you're okay with, I don't know, would it be something that I know people would love to read it? Is it something you and I can talk about this in the uh, separately, but it is out there. It's like the only one that we know of. That's and awesome. So, so I certainly want to get, I think I did send it to you. So it's, it's something that you can, can look through yourself at some point. For sure. Um, and I guess that's it. You know, this has been a great, I want to just share a couple little things before we go. Some people wanted to say hello to you, and then we will let you get on with your Black Friday shopping and the rest of the month. So here's <laughs> a couple. I'll be hiding under the bed crying. I don't go out on Black Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Let me uh, share a couple little little moments for you. Oh, wrong one. Of course, I went to the, can I go back here? Here we go. Hi, Lorelai. Happy anniversary, 25 years. Hey, it's Gary Spinrad. I uh, just want to say I am honored to have worked on the same project as you and to essentially have kicked off my career with you. And I'm very grateful for everything that it's brought to me. Hi, Lorelai. Congratulations on the anniversary of Phantasmagoria 2. I'm so proud that I had the opportunity to work on this project. At the time, I didn't know we were working on a game that had any social import or would have impact on people's lives. But hearing the various stories during this recap of interviews that Paul has been doing. It's been really exciting and inspiring to know that the game that we created uh, was able to be so meaningful to people. I'm really proud that I had the opportunity to work on this with you and congratulations on its anniversary. Lorelai, I cannot believe that it has been 25 years since Phantasmagoria 2. We must have just been babies, right? <laughs> Congratulations and thank you for creating Phantasmagoria 2. As an actress, it has been, was so amazing to me at that point in my career and what a gift you have given so many people for so many years. Thank you, Lorelai. Hi, Lorelai, and here. I just wanted to take a moment and tell you what a great joy it was getting to collaborate with you and direct Phantasmagoria Puzzle of Flesh. It was in something very special to me and something I'll always remember. We got the chance to work with some very talented people, the young, hot film crew, some wonderful actors, but I think the real star of Phantasmagoria Puzzle Flesh was you. Your innovative game design, your creative storytelling, and your good humor made it something very, very special. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Love you and love to you and yours. Oh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> that <laughs> Lorelai, is so wonderful. Laura and you, you created something incredible. And I, I don't think I, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't talk about this game, not because I was, it just was something that disappeared from my life. Uh, and uh, when people started reaching out to me, I didn't really know what to do with it. I didn't know uh, if it was because they were making fun or what have you. I, 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 so I stayed in the shadows for a long time. And I never quite knew if this thing that I did, I, it had more meaning than I ever expected. And, and it's because of you and this thing that we did a long time ago, it just shows that uh, you never know uh, the impact you can have. Um, it's, it's, a, it's wonderful life moment. You know, you just don't know what, uh, what, what you're able to do and what you did truly has impacted many people, including myself. And so I wanna just thank you personally and say happy anniversary of this thing that we did. And uh, uh, I can't thank you enough for, for joining me today. 
Well, thank you enormously for having me. Thank you for putting together Conversations with Curtis. This is absolutely magnificent. I'm working my way through it and it is just wonderful. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to, you know, the cast and crew and everybody who worked on it. It was an amazing collaborative effort. Everybody was important. Everybody contributed something unique and fantastic. And finally, I want to say thank you to everybody who enjoyed this game in whatever capacity to all the fans. If it affected you in a positive way in any sense, that makes me incredibly happy. <laughs> Best holiday gift ever. Yeah. Well, before I let you go, Gary Spinrad has the last word. He has a very important question. And I feel like we just need to get to the bottom of this and then we'll, we'll let you say goodbye. But this is a, <laughs> a, a 25 year old question that I think we need to find the answer. Well, I guess if I do have a question to ask, it's, well, when we were at the wrap party, you, Stetler, and Hoyos got into what we thought was dried cucumber, but it turned out to be peyote. And um, you three were screaming about those goddamn bats. What do you see those goddamn bats? I appreciate the literary reference, but nonetheless, uh, after that, you started screaming about how John F. Kennedy was going to be uh, appearing in Daily Square. Oddly prescient, I get it, but nonetheless, it uh, kind of spiraled out of control after that. After that, it was uh, screaming and what I could only only uh, guest was Farsi running around naked in Bellevue Square. It was uh, quite impressive. So um, did, did anything ever come of that? I, I, I would be curious. Um, thank you. I could like some closure on this. Thank you very much. Yeah, we got to get some closure on that. That was a crazy day. Oh, sorry, I got to get back here. Yeah, we, I think that's one of those things that we probably just need to uh, not, I think that's, that's just going to live and die with us. That was, uh, that was a I think so. <laughs> Good time. Well, I think so much. Have a great rest of your weekend. It's a pleasure. And, uh, and I hope we get to stay in touch. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll come up with something fun to do creatively together in the not too distant future. I would love that. All right. Everyone, thank you. Please say thank you to Lorelai. And uh, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll say goodbye to you now. And then I'll say goodbye to everybody. And then you and I can sign All off. Right. Thanks, okay, cool. everybody. All right. All right. Well, that is our show, everyone. What an amazing um, conversation. Uh, it will be available for to watch us on, on our YouTube channel. Uh, I can't thank you all enough for, for jo joining me today, and I hope you all have a great weekend. I do want to just do one final push. If you like the show today, if you like what I'm doing here, please join me on Patreon. Uh, I'm hoping for 10 members uh, by the end of the day. It would mean a lot so that we can move forward. Uh, into our interview with Victoria next month and then into new games uh, in 2022. So please think about that. Please consider joining and helping support this uh, very exciting project and let's keep it going. Uh, meanwhile, thank you uh, for everything and um, take care. Bye.